Hello and welcome to your case study of a volcanic eruption. Our example that we're going to be using is Mount St. Helens, which is located on the west coast of North America in the state of Washington. It formed at a destructive plate margin and it erupted on the May 18th, 1980. So how and why did Mount St. Helens erupt? Mount St. Helens is formed because it lies on a destructive plate margin. The Juan de Fuca plate moves towards the North American plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is denser because it is oceanic and so it is subducted beneath the North American plate, which is the lighter continental plate. As the Juan de Fuca plate subducts, as shown by the arrow here, into the mantle, it melts and it turns into magma, so you get blobs of magma. This magma collects underneath the continental plate and over time develops into a magma chamber. Pressure builds up and the magma is forced to the surface through cracks in the continental plate. When this magma reaches the surface, it oozes out as sticky lava and over time it will build up into layers and form a steep-sided cone-shaped volcano. This is called a composite volcano. The lava repeats its eruption and over time it will build up to form a steep-sided volcano, which is what Mount St. Helens became. Also at this plate margin, where I'm drawing on my crosses, we can see that the two plates rub past each other. Here, pressure builds up between the two plates and friction and this pressure eventually will be overcome and as the plates slip past each other, there is earthquakes. On May 18th, 1980, this action at this plate boundary resulted in magma erupting to the surface and the volcano going off. We need to consider what primary and secondary effects of volcanic eruption can result in. Here we have a general table detailing the primary and secondary effects. Primary effects are defined as the immediate consequences caused directly by the volcanic eruption and they include buildings being destroyed by fires, explosions, the weight of the ash, crops and livestock being destroyed. Secondary effects are defined as the consequences that follow in the days and weeks after a volcanic eruption. This includes mud flows from the ash combining with rainfall or rivers and flowing down the mountainside in these rivers of mud. Also includes changes in landscape and the climate. Food, water supply will be disrupted. Homelessness will occur as homes may be destroyed and people displaced from them. Businesses may be forced to close and the cost of insurance claims is also considered to be a secondary effect. Lastly, Unemployment due to the closure of businesses is a secondary effect. These are general effects that can be applied to any volcano. In the context of Mount St. Helens, we need to consider some facts and figures to support our primary and secondary effects of this eruption. So on the left hand side of the table, we have the primary effects. 200 homes were destroyed from the Mount St. Helens eruption. 57 people died from burns and from the suffocating ash. This is a low number of people and is an indicator that there was some, some management happening at this volcanic eruption. 185 miles of roads were ruined, causing there to be problems with getting into the area. Crops, including wheat and apples, were covered in ash and destroyed. The secondary effects of the eruption include 1.1 billion US dollars in damage costs, 
Interstate 90, a main road, was closed for one week, causing disruption and problems in getting into the area. Mud flows covered buildings and roads and had to be cleared away before people could access their homes or businesses. Some positive secondary effects are the ash weathered and added nutrients to the soil in the long term, which made the area good for farming again. People wanted to visit the volcano for themselves to see what impact it had, so there was an increase in tourism which brought income into the area as people needed somewhere to stay, to eat, have drink, to buy souvenirs from. That concludes the primary and secondary effects of the Mount St Helens 1980 eruption. So just to reiterate, as well as negative effects of a volcanic eruption, volcanoes do have some positive impacts. Number one is the fertile soils that the lava and ash break down to produce. They are composed of nutrients and as they weather, these nutrients are released back into the soil, producing high quality farmland from which farmers can make good profits from. In the run up to the eruption of Mount St Helens, people were excited to see a volcano in action, so flocked to the area. They all needed somewhere to stay and they needed food, souvenirs, etc., providing jobs for people who lived near to Mount St Helens. In the aftermath of the volcano, people continued to flock to the area to see the eruption and the devastation for themselves. The third positive impact of volcanic eruptions and volcanoes is the opportunity for mining. Lots of minerals like gold, silver, diamonds, copper, sulphur and pumice are found in the rock on the slopes of volcanoes such as Mount St Helens. Companies open up mines and they need workers to work in these mines and these come from the local towns such as Mount St Helens um, villages and towns on its slopes. Next we can need to consider how we categorise responses to a volcanic eruption. We do this by referring to immediate responses and long-term responses. Immediate responses are things that we do to help survivors in the days and the weeks after the tectonic event. And they include evacuating people, providing temporary shelters, food and water. Longer-term responses are things we try to do to prevent disasters like this happening again in the future. So we improve the monitoring, we have more practice drills, we make hazard maps to use for the future to identify areas that may be of potential risk if an eruption was to happen again. The immediate responses to the Mount St Helens volcanic eruption were masks were sent through by President Carter immediately and 200 million in total were sent. Homes at Spirit Lake were evacuated to take people out of the risk zone. Helicopters were sent in for search and rescue. And survivors were rescued and provided with emergency medical treatment in nearby towns. Long-term responses were that 1.4 million US dollars were spent on improving the area to attract tourists back. Fallen timber had to be removed and in the north the forest was replanted. Buildings and bridges had to be rebuilt to help the infrastructure get back on its feet. We also need to consider how we monitor and predict volcanic eruptions. There are four main ways we do this. Number one is we look at the volcano shape. As magma moves up the, uh, the vent and comes near the surface, we find that the volcano will change in shape. The sides, also referred to as flanks of a volcano, will bulge and this can cause their angle of slope to change. And we measure this using a piece of equipment called a tilt meter. It's very similar to a builder's level. And as the angle of the slope changes, this tilt meter will show a change in the level. We also look at water levels. So some volcanoes have lakes on the side of them, such as Spirit Lake at Mount St Helens. We can monitor the water level to see if magma 
is extruding or oozing out onto the floor of the lake. So if the water level rises, this suggests that there's magma moving up from below. We can also look at the water temperatures, and if we see an increase in temperature, this indicates that again magma is moving up from below the Earth's surface and rising to the surface. The third way we can monitor and predict volcanic eruptions is the monitoring of earthquake activity. As the oceanic plate subducts beneath the continental plate, it is not a smooth movement and there is friction and pressure between the, earth, uh, the two plates. So we get earthquakes. But also, as the magma rises up from the magma chamber through the vent, it pushes against the surrounding rock and this can cause small tremors as the pressure is released. It is the recording of these small earthquakes that can indicate that magma is rising to the surface and suggest that an, a volcano is likely to happen. The last way we can predict volcanic eruptions is by looking at emissions of gases. Volcanic emissions may increase before an eruption and the piece of equipment we use to measure this is called a spectrometer. This specifically measures the amount of sulphur dioxide gas given off by a volcano. If this increases, this suggests that the magma is rising to the surface and that a volcano is likely to erupt. At Mount St Helens, the following monitoring and prediction techniques were used in 1980. Firstly, there was a piece of equipment called a spider. This is a robot and was used to take measurements of the volcano and monitor its changes. Tilt meters were also placed on the slopes of Mount St Helens and used to measure changes in the size of the volcano in terms of its slope angle. Temperature changes in the groundwater were also measured and used to indicate whether the eruption was going to happen or not. That completes this presentation on Mount St Helens May 18th, 1980 eruption.